And now, let me introduce, in case you weren't here last Sunday, our new pastor, Dr. Randy Carney. Inviting us to be your pastor, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and for all that the Lord's done. And I would say uh, it, it's true. I do have a doctor's degree, as Dr. Randy Carney is correct. Uh, but I, I was just thinking about it. It reminded me of a time in my life whenever I was uh, uh, by vocational. I've been by vocational most of my life in ministry and some of the things I've been doing. And so there was a time whenever I was at uh, Freeman Chapel, Free Will Baptist Church, and uh, that particular time to make money to be able to be in the ministry. I've, I've had all these string of temporary jobs throughout my lifetime. So one time I worked for Radio Shack and uh, lots of times I would come up in seasonal areas and then it would be over with after Christmas time, but many times they would ask me to stay on for a while, which I considered that as a compliment. But anyway, this one particular time, though, I was a pastor at Freeman Chapel, and I had some college students that were working with me, and uh, we were, uh, you know, working with a Christian college, and they were getting credits through that. And then I worked down at Kinko's Copies, <laughs> down in Carbondale. It used to be just south of the campus there at SIU. And uh, I, so I worked there for a while, and then I ended up doing the night shift, and I was the only one there for a while where I did that. But, but the times when I was there with other employees, I, I just uh, was singing about these caps here. You know, you gave me a cap. And I was wearing all these different caps, but I was still the same person. And that was interesting as to how you were perceived. So I would go to church, and I'd be Brother Randy. And so, you know, I like that. And then I would go to college, and I'd be Dr. Carney. And then I'd go down to Kinko's Copies, and nobody ever said this, but I felt like they thought, that's Randy the Jerk. So, well, but thank you for the invitation, brother. It is correct. And so I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, we had talked about, we got a letter from Camp Hope, and uh, wanting, or they had us listed for cleaning one of the dorms, one of the boys' dorms, and it was rooms one and two. And so we mentioned it on Wednesday night, and I asked if, Anybody had some ideas when they could go or whatever and uh, uh, to let me know, and so nobody let me know. So then after that run, then I tried to figure out whenever we could go. And so, so we mentioned uh, May 16th, trying to get it done before the lunch bunch uh, comes about and all of that. But if there's a group of you that can go some other time, let us know. We'll go some other time. But anyway, we talked to Ryan there, and uh, right now they're expecting us in the afternoon on Tuesday, May 16th. And I already know some of you can't go. And I also know that whatever time you pick, there'll be somebody that can't go. <laughs> so we have that listed. But if some of you are inclined to go a different time, let us know. And we'll do that. We've still got one more week before we let everybody else know when that would be. So, well, Moses was furious. Moses was furious. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 31, you'll see what he was furious about. And in Numbers 31, verse 14, it says Moses became furious. And uh, so that's how it was put in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And I'd like to read the three verses surrounding that. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version because that's what I have here before me. But it said, But Moses was angry with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, who had come 
from the battle. And Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. But Moses was furious, or he was wroth, or he was angry because of what the people had done. Now today I want to talk about Moses' experience with anger, and, but then there is unrighteous anger, there's righteous anger, and there's the most righteous anger of all. Now, I don't know if any of you ever have any problem with anger in your own life, but Moses had some problems with anger at different times in his life. Moses was known as the meekest man on the earth. The problem with the word meekness is it rhymes with weakness. And, but Moses definitely was not a weak individual. In fact, really, the definition, one definition of meekness is, is there a ringing to you folks, or is it just to me? Okay. Uh, so the definition of meekness is strength or anger under control. And so Moses was known as the meekest man of all the earth. But that means that he had to learn how to deal with anger in his life. So there were uh, three times that Moses was involved in experiencing anger. Sometimes he had unrighteous anger, and sometimes he had righteous anger. So there was uh, a time whenever he grew up in the king's palace, and uh, D.L. Moody said that Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. And then... Later on, he came forth one day and he saw some of his Hebrew, uh, his people that were being mistreated by an Egyptian, terribly mistreating him. And his anger arose. And it got to where that he had the opportunity to be around the Egyptian all by himself. And his anger just rose more and more, and he finally killed the Egyptian. And then he dug some areas in the sand, and he tried to hide the Egyptian's body there after he had killed him. He looked left and right. No one was around. He thought the next day that he had, uh, he had got away with it. Well, he came and he found some of the Hebrews that were having an argument among themselves. And so he started trying to stop that. And one of them said, what, who, who are you to be talking to us like that? And then he said, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses then knew that the deed was known. So Moses had some unrighteous anger there, and it cost him dearly. He knew that if he was brought before a court, that he would be found guilty because he was guilty. And so he killed a person because of his anger, and so he ran away. He was a fugitive for 40 years. Now, I don't know if there's a statute of limitations on murder, but after 40 years, God allowed him to return. He was 80 years old at this time. And whenever they came back, they never brought this back up. I never did understand that. But D.L. Moody said that Moses spent 40 years being in the palace of Pharaoh, growing up maybe in line for the throne, thinking he was somebody. And then because of his anger, he had to flee away and so for those 40 years, he felt like a nobody. And then after those 40 years, God spoke to him and told him to go back to Egypt and lead his people out of bondage. And so then he spent 40 years finding out what God can do with a nobody. 
And you know, that's what we need to have in our lives. Sometimes we think we're something, and sometimes we think we're nothing. But we just need to know that whatever comes from our efforts, whatever good things comes, it comes from God. And so we need to be able to do that. But he had that unrighteous anger. So then he led the uh, people out of Egypt, and there came a time where they didn't have any water. And God told Moses to gather the people at a certain place and that he was to take his rod and strike the rock, and they would have water. So they came to that, and uh, Moses told them that here we are without water, and he struck the rock, and water gushed out. And so God provided for his people. Well, then they disobeyed God, and he had to deal with that all the time. Disobedience, disobedience, disobedience. Uh, some of you parents say, I'm dealing with disobedience, disobedience, disobedience. But God many times is dealing with us in disobedience, disobedience. And, but he, he spent that 40 years, and there came another time when they did not have any water. And this time, God told Moses to gather the people together, but he was very, very specific. He said, speak to the rock, and I will provide water. But Moses was so angry with the people, instead of doing what God told him to do, he, in his anger, raised up that rod, and he said, Here, you rebels, must we bring forth water from this rock? And he struck the rock. And God was gracious to the people. He allowed the water to come again. But he took Moses aside, and he said, Because you did not glorify me by speaking to the rock. It made it look like that you struck it with your rod, that it was something you did, and I, I don't know that God said, I know I told you to do that before. But the point was, they would have to know it was from God if Moses only spoke to the rock. And so God said, you did not glorify me. And because of that, you will not be able to go into the promised land. See, Moses had some problems with anger, and it cost him. And he was not able to go into the promised land whenever the people went in. God is gracious, though. And 3,000 years later, <laughs> a place called the Mount of Transfiguration, the, some of the disciples were with Jesus, and they saw Elijah and Moses and Jesus all in the promised land. He finally got to go there, but I imagine after spending 3,000 years in heaven, it didn't matter very much whether he got to go there or not. But he had a problem with anger. And then, so there is an unrighteous anger, and an unrighteous anger can be a sudden anger. A sudden anger is something that needs to be controlled. A sudden anger, sometimes it just flies upon you, it just rises upon you. And if you feel that happening, it's important then that you bring it under control as quickly as you can. Moses would have been better off if he had done that in a couple of instances there. But, so there's sudden anger that it needs to be controlled. Now we can't just... Uh, Make the excuse, well, that's just me, you know. I, I, that's just how I am. God specializes in taking people who are just how they are and making new creatures out of them. And if we will submit ourselves to God, he can come in and he can change our actions. Now, I heard uh, Adrian Rogers was talking about this one time, and he said it was like this. He said, you can control it. He said, because there was a husband and wife that they were having a family discussion that could be heard two houses over. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so they were going, rawr, 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 and then the phone rang, 
and one of them went, hello. <laughs> he said, you can control it. You can. Sudden anger needs to be controlled. And sinful anger needs to be condemned. Not all anger is bad, but it needs to fall within the guidelines that God has put for us. In the New Testament, it said, Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be guilty of hellfire. So there is a sinful anger and an anger without a cause, and it needs to be condemned. It needs to be confessed. It needs to be repented of. And if it's something that, and I know we all have different things, we become new creatures in Christ, but we all have certain things that God allows us to take a little time for it to develop and grow and for our, our sanctification to come about. Sometimes not as quick in some areas as it is others. So they're doing that, but it needs to be confessed and brought under control. Then there is stubborn anger. Stubborn anger needs to be conquered. Stubborn anger is where you allow that anger to come into your life and it just begins to seethe and it gets worse and worse. Scripture says, uh, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And so many married couples find great value in that verse. Because if they don't deal with something pretty quickly that they're both angry about within their lives, then it doesn't get better. It just kind of gets worse. Just kind of begins to grow, begins to seethe. Sometimes it comes to the point to where it just explodes. So there is a stubborn anger. These are all examples of unrighteous anger. Two examples in the life of Moses. But there is also a righteous anger. Now, I confess, I was uh, kind of reluctant to read this whole chapter to you because it expresses some things that uh, don't seem to fit in our modern way of thinking. And, but you know what? There are a lot of things in our modern way of thinking that are not right. <laughs> some of the days we have... Uh, discussions about uh, men and women and who's a man and who is a woman. You have some things that go along and uh, they're just discussions that come on that would never have been discussed before. They're just amazing things that come our way. But anyway, there is a righteous anger. In this passage of Scripture, though, it talks about them going in and making war. And they were going to be at war against the Midianites. And they were told that they were going to take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Well, modern warfare has come to the point to where they have even developed rules for war. They're not always followed, but they're developed. It's like it's supposed to be. Uh, you're supposed to have military targets. You're supposed to have compassion upon the citizens of the other country. But back in Moses' day, it was not just the military soldiers that you would be fighting against. If you went into a town, all the citizens of the town would join with the military people. And uh, they, uh, you would either kill them first or they would kill you first. And so it wasn't limited just to the men. It mentions the women here. And so that's why I was a little reluctant to talk about this because God said go in and destroy them all. Destroy both the men and the women. And those soldiers did not do it. They spared the women. And Moses was angry with them because he said, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. That was just a period of time. There was Balaam. He was called. He was supposed to curse the children of Israel. 
And he said, I won't do it. I will only do what God tells me to say. And God told him to bless the children of Israel instead of cursing them. But then they came up with a strategy. And the strategy was this. They were going to have the women come and and seduce the men of Israel. They were going to have them do that. And then they were going to lead them off into idolatry. And they did. And it was successful. And that's why Moses was saying here, God was saying you need to eliminate them all. Now, you, you would think of a certain person, you would look at them, and we look on the outward appearance, do we not? But God knows what's deep down inside. And God knows what the motives are deep down inside. And he knows where wickedness is. And he knows where there's not going to be repentance in an individual's life. And so he said, they need to be wiped out. And anyway, the officers disobeyed the command of God. And Moses was angry because of that. There is a righteous anger. You had uh, Jesus went into the temple, you know, and uh, he had some righteous anger there. They had a practice of changing the money. You say, well, why would they do that? Well, they were to come to the temple. They were to bring a lamb or a bull or a bird or gold or something for an offering. And people that lived so far away, it was a real hardship on them to bring their own plots. So they got to where they would get closer to the temple, and there were others around that uh, they made commerce out of this. They brought their lambs and bulls and things, and they had them for sale. And they were supposed to be the good, you know, the kind that were acceptable without blemish and all of that. So the people would come from a distance, and then they could buy the animals that are close to the temple. Well, then to make it even more convenient, they started bringing them into the courtyard of the temple, and they started selling them there. This still could have been good. It still could have been a service. But then the people that were selling got kind of greedy. And so they were selling... Uh, well, anyway, they're just making a, a real business out of it and, and um, making the commerce overshadow the rest. You also had the money changers. So they come from different areas, so they had different currency. And the people that were selling the animals would only accept their currency. So they would have to go in to a place and have their currency exchanged. I think it started as a service, probably started as a service. So they say, well, you bring the money, you need to pay for our time, so we will exchange it for a certain fee. But then greed kicks in, and after a while they're charging exorbitant fees to change the money. And those that are selling the animals, they are selling them at higher prices too. And then they are doing it in such a way that it causes chaos in the area, in the courtyards of the temple. And Jesus walks into the scene, and he said, this is not what our worship needs to look like. It does not need to be this chaos, and it does not need to be this greed. And he then got some cords, and he fashioned a whip. And he went over and he overturned the money changers' tables. And he, in anger, drove them out of the temple. Those that others had bought and sold, he drove them out. And he said, this is to be a house of prayer, and you have made it a house of merchandise. But Jesus had a righteous anger. And Moses had a righteous anger here. Well, what is a righteous anger? Human beings can have righteous anger. The Bible says, Be ye angry, but sin not. There is a type of anger that is proper. Just don't sin while you're involved in that anger. So, it is whatever makes God mad, 
Oh, they make us mad. Whatever makes God angry, if it makes us angry too, then that is a righteous anger. And we don't need to be a self-righteous anger, thinking that we're better than other people. But whenever we see things that make God angry, I give you an example of the, it, uh, you have little bitty babies that are having their lives taken from them. I think that makes God angry. And it makes some of us angry. And I think it's proper for us to be angry. And that ought to be an area that we should be angry about. There are other things that come that are completely against the Word of God. And if that makes us angry, then that's a righteous angry anger, if we don't get self-righteous about it at least. But there is a righteous anger. But there is the most righteous anger of all. You had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You always have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've always had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. We have a little problem in our minds because for each person, there is an individual being like well, here, we've we, we got three right here. Why don't you just do it this way? <laughs> here we go. Here's three of us, right? Okay. You are. You are. I am. Each of us have our individual being, our individual existence. But in God's case, though, there is one being, but three persons. Now, you say, well, how do you explain that? Well, I don't know, but I believe it. <laughs> because that's the only way you can put all the scriptures together to describe God. It's called the Godhead in the New Testament, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there was a time whenever at Jesus' baptism, a voice came from heaven and the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove, and the Son, of course, was present on earth at that time. Well, so God, in his fullness, in his threeness, and his oneness, and his three and one, however you put that together, one of these days we'll get it all figured out whenever we enter into heaven and we have the complete mind of Christ. I said, we're going to make a world, and we're going to put human beings on this world. And they're not going to be mindless human beings. They are going to be able to choose to make decisions. They're going to be like us in that respect, in being able to make decisions. And then perhaps, and maybe it's not like it was, but just... Say that the Son says to the Father, but what will we do if they don't choose us? And then you understand that God is holy and just and cannot look upon sin. And the problem is, what happens when human beings do not choose to accept God's love? So, the well, there needs to be a payment for sin. Talked about that last week, didn't we? And the payment you do not want to receive, the payment for sin, which would be forever separation from God. And it describes later on the description of death and hell being cast into the lake of fire to be separated from God. So there was a problem. They were going to create men and women with the power of choice but what would happen if they chose wrongly? Then they would deserve that payment for sin, which is death. And so then they said, well, there can be a way that, that can be taken care of. A death can take place, and then we can make it where it counts for those individuals who chose wrongly. 
And the son says, Father, I'll do it. And so you go throughout the rest of history. Human history begins. You come into the New Testament times. And in the fullness of time, Jesus was born. God the Son came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. Therefore, he would be that sinless substitute. He would be that lamb without blemish. Metaphorically speaking, the lamb without blemish. The lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So it came time for him after he lived the sinless life, proving that he was the divine son of God and that he could pay the penalty for sin. So God could still be just because the penalty was going to be paid for. But now, if you, if you are a parent, think about this. If you give your son or your daughter to help someone else, and if your son or your daughter decides to help someone else, and somebody comes along and says, oh, thank you, for what your family has done for us, that makes you feel wonderful, doesn't it? But what if somebody comes along and just kind of looks down on that? That doesn't make you feel so good. Well, what about where the father gives his son? And Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. However bad we could feel for somebody rejecting our children, think what it is like for a holy God to be rejected like that. Think what it is like for his son to have taken upon himself the sins of the whole world and how that on the cross he shed his blood. And in that shedding of blood, there was a payment for sin. And then he offers salvation to us as a free gift. And people sometimes will come and they will hear that and they will understand that. And they will come and accept that free gift. And whenever they do, all of heaven rejoices. The angels rejoice. There's one that was lost and now he's redeemed. He's come back. He's done that. But to understand the wrath of God is somebody rejects that. The Bible calls it trampling under your feet the blood of the covenant. God has done everything he can to help every one of us. And when we reject it, or maybe we even mock Christ, or maybe we even take the word of God and tear it up and do that. Not we, I hope, not us, but people that do that Maybe you can understand the wrath of God just a little bit better. Several years ago, um, Brother James Robinson came to West Frankfort, Illinois, and he had a crusade there, sort of like the Billy Graham Crusades. They had it in the high school gym at West Frankfort. And uh, Rhonda and I went two or three nights to that, and one night we were sitting on the side, and we looked over to the side, coming up to the side of the bleachers over there, and uh, we recognized a man that was from Rhonda's hometown. He's a man that had a good reputation. He was there that night, but we understood that he was not a Christian. And James Robinson said, before this night is over with, you're going to be confronted with a choice. And he painted the picture of Jesus dying on the cross. And then he painted a picture of there was the dead body of Jesus there. And he was saying that if you're going to go to hell, you're going to have to, that body is going to prevent you from accepting Christ. You will have to step over that body and go on your own way, something like that. And, uh, well, I'm happy to report, at the invitation, we saw this man get up and walk down, and he got saved that night. But before the message was over with, Brother Robinson gave this little story 
how it was a true story or not. But he said that there was a young couple that loved each other, and they got married. And their love for each other was so evident to others that were around, just like models of love. But then there came a period of time whenever the husband suffered some disappointments. And he started trying to deal with it the best that he could. And then he turned to alcohol. And there came a change in his behavior, at least part of the time. At least whenever he drank, his behavior changed. His demeanor changed. And then it got so bad that on occasion, the wife would show up with some bruises. And her friends would say, why do you put up with it? And she would say, because he's not that way all the time. Whenever he's sober, he's a really good individual. And I put up with it because I love him so much. Well, you would hope that things got better, but they got worse. And they had a child. Now she loved the husband, but she had a little baby that she loved also. She loved both of them. She would excuse her husband, continue to excuse him. But one night, he came home and... Uh, came into the kitchen, and she had the baby sitting up on the counter uh, in the kitchen, and he came in, and then she realized that he was not himself, and he was just angry and, and you know, displaying his anger and all that, and she was afraid for herself. But before she could get over to the counter, he, not knowing what he was doing, hit the baby, knocked it off down in the floor, and... Brother Robinson said, this woman who had such love for her husband in an instant had that love turn to hate because she saw the baby's head split open. Now, God gave his son who indeed shed his blood for us, who indeed died for us, and God loves us, and he loves everyone, and he loves the whole world. But whenever someone comes and this despises what the Son did, then you can understand how the love of God can turn to hate. And if his capacity for love is so much greater than ours as human beings, then his capacity for wrath is that much greater too. I just want to say God loves every one of us. And if you have never come to Christ, you ought to come to him. Because he offers you a free gift. You can have eternal life in heaven and not be separated from God. But if you spurn that gift and you spurn the love of God, instead of having that future love, you have the wrath of God to look forward to. And it is a just wrath, and it is a righteous anger, and it is the most righteous anger.